So today's last lecture. So today we're going to basically preview 3720. So recall, so we'll start with second order systems, right? So recall that this is where we stop, that the general uh, transfer function was this, okay? So there were some characteristics of second order systems. You remember what they were? So omega n, recall, is called what? Now, natural frequency, right? The units are radians per second, and zeta is the damping ratio, and it's dimensionless. Okay. So what were some of the characteristics of the second order of second order systems? Like some time domain characteristics, settling time. What was the expression for settling time? So Ts, and if you, it's, it's very similar to first order, except the denominator is zeta omega n, and that's kind of obvious if you look at the pole zero plot, right? Assuming underdamped response, okay? So here is minus zeta omega n. Here is square root of one minus omega n squared times zeta times j. Okay, so let me write that down. Let's see. And I messed this up as usual. Doesn't make any sense. There. Times j. And this fellow was negative omega and j. Negative sign there. So here is the real part of your complex conjugate pole. And recall for first order it was 4 over a, right? Remember that? The settling time, so it's very similar, okay? And then what else? We had a percent overshoot, correct? Which was e to the minus zeta pi over square root of 1 minus zeta squared times 100, okay? That was that. And then we had peak time, right? Um, peak time was pi over omega n, I believe, times square root of 1 minus zeta squared, all right? And then the rise time, we have to determine from a table because there's no closed form expression. Okay. So a natural question, two natural questions, actually three, all right? So question one is how do zeros of a transfer function effect response, the answer, which you will pursue further in 3720 is, they affect amplitude of the time response. And this is zeros of a transfer function and input, okay, if you will, but basically they affect the amplitude. The only exception to this, which you'll again, I mean, You'll, it's not an exception. You'll, there is, what happens if you have a right half plane zero, okay? It doesn't affect the stability, of course, because it's a zero, but what could happen is you could have something called as a non-minimum phase system. That is, your system might initially respond, like let's say you have a step response of one, your system might initially go negative and then come positive, right? It's, that's called as a non-minimum phase system. I'll just write it here, and again, all of this is like 3720 ideas. No. Your motor will, so the question was, non-minimum phase system implies right half plane zero, okay? And the question was, how does it affect the motor response or any response for that matter? That means your, well, system output is initially opposite. So your motor will turn in the opposite direction and then come back in. Well, it depends on what is the order of your system, get it jog back but the bottom line is your response will initially be opposite of the, so if it's a positive step, your initial response will be negative. That's all. Number one, I mean that's point number one. Question number two is how do what about 
higher order systems okay, higher order that means greater than or equal to third order transfer functions and the answer is we will try and use a second order approximation if the real part of your higher order poles okay so the real part of your higher order poles the magnitude is greater than five times the magnitude of the real part of your second order poles so as a very simple example let's say your second order poles were somewhere over here let's put some numbers in here so i don't know negative 2 okay square root of 3j minus square root of 3j okay and let's say your higher order poles were I mean this is not to scale we're at negative 51 negative 50 something like that right I'm gonna make it let's make it more spaced out doesn't matter and negative 72 negative 93 something right? so when you take the inverse Laplace transform to find the time response given an input what kind of response do these poles there on the real axis they could be complex conjugates it doesn't matter in the sense that poles in mean, roots on the real axis what kind of time response do they give you if you can answer this that means you understand 30 50 right for the most part so so poles on the real axis imply what in the time domain? What kind of response? This is oscillatory, right? Because you have complex conjugates. Yes? No, not linear. What kind of function? That's what I'm looking for. What kind of function you will see in the time domain? Exponential. Decaying exponential, yes? But do these decay very fast compared to this one or no? They do, right? Because this, so what is the S domain expression for this? It's 1 over S plus 93, correct? So you take the inverse Laplace transform of this, this is 1 over S minus minus 93. So it's e to something e to the minus 93 T, right? Yes? Yeah, dig is very fast compared to this. So before this response, can take effect, quote unquote, this is gone. So these poles are not going to affect your second order poles. They are obviously five times larger than the magnitude. The magnitude of this is 72, the magnitude of this is 93, which is five times greater than the magnitude of the real part, which is two, so five times two is 10, okay? Make sense? So this five times is just a rule of thumb. That's what control engineers use. So on this second order approximation, again, you'll study in more detail in 3720. Okay. So the final thing we're going to do, the third question, is designing control systems. Uh, basically, PID controllers, which is the subject of 3720. And to understand this, uh, so how to turn into a question design control systems the answer when I mean, looking at your table of contents is you step one is you stabilize system via negative feedback okay and we looked at an example of this a couple of weeks ago when you took a simple first order system that was unstable and put it in negative feedback with a p controller remember that we were able to change the pole location, but in the process, you remember something happened. What did we? What did feedback affect in addition to stability? 
You remember? No. Something else. Document or my notes. My notes. So when you put it in feedback, okay, we stabilized the system, but it also affected something else. No, not the frequency response, yeah. No, more specifically, Z, not the zero. So, no. No, <laughs> it's not the impedance. It's not. So what did it affect? What was the steady state output of our system in feedback? You remember? So we put a step response. What should the steady state output have been? Remember the final value theorem? We so we put a step unit step in to our system. At steady state, what should have been the output value? One. What was it when you put it in feedback? Yes, it affected the final steady state value. So what did I call it? There's a term for it. It introduced what? Yes. So step two is, well, this is a usual process. Okay. Step two is we compensate for steady state error. Okay. So and then if you look at it chapter wise, stabilized system via negative feedback is basically chapter five and we did cover this a little bit when we simplified that feedback system remember that we wrote it as one uh, transfer function that's basically chapter five right but then compensating for steady state uh, well this is chapter five i'm sorry and chapter six okay there's something called as the Routh horowitz criterion that tells you how to find the right half plane poles which lead to instability of your system without solving for the roots of the denominator for a rational transfer function or the poles of the system anyway that's chapter six but then what you do is in chapter seven you compensate for steady state errors using the concept of system type okay type one Type 2 and type basically refers to the number of integrators. If you have one integrator, okay, it's called type 1. If you have two integrators, it's called type 2, etc. Right? But when you introduce integrators to compensate for steady state error, you will affect the transient response because you're introducing another pole. Yes? So you have to go back and design for transient response. And this is the usual order of control design. You, st you definitely have to stabilize the system. Okay? You can't compensate a system that's unstable. It doesn't make any sense. But then, usually people can't zero out steady state, well, not zero out, uh, make steady state error meet the specs. And then they compensate for the transient response. Some people, they compensate for the trial. Actually, I don't know a lot who do that, who compensate for the transient response first, and then minimize steady state error. This is the usual process. This is basically, there are a variety of techniques to do this. You will primarily cover root locus. So it's chapter 8. And then let's see. Chapters 8 and 9, actually, from your book. Root locus, okay. And then chapter 10. It turns out you can use body plots to do this. Okay. This is chapters 10 and 11 actually okay so that's pretty much 3720 there is I'll put in a star you can also design in state space this is chapter 12 in your book okay and then there is digital control you don't I don't think you will cover this in 3720 chapter 13 okay this is chapter 12 and 13 that's why i put it in star 
So that's how you take the knowledge you gained in 3050 and translate it into control systems design. Yeah. And there are also some visual implications. That is what happens, and we briefly addressed this last lecture, that is what happens as I move the pole, for example, diagonally, okay? There is a maintain the same angle. Your uh, damping ratio doesn't change. Remember that? So, for example, looking at your peak time, okay? I mean, you can just look at this here, right? If I move the poles vertically, right? That is, I keep the same real part. Does your peak time change? Yes, it does, right? What does not change if my poles move vertically? That is, my pole just moves like that. Out of these quantities, what does not change? Settling time. JP is right, okay? Percent overshoot does not change if you move diagonally because zeta doesn't change, yes? So how do I make sure my peak time is constant? How do I move these poles? So I need to make sure this doesn't change, right? Is there any way I can do that? I mean, there's only one more direction, right? We did this, we did this, so what's the only one? So we did vertical, we did diagonal. What's the other one? Horizontal, right? I move horizontally, the magnitude of this guy doesn't change. Same peak time, okay? So again, these are the techniques, all these, all of this comes from second order systems, okay? So if you, you really have to understand 30, 50 in terms of, first of all, how do you derive transfer functions? We did this for um, electric, first of all, we talked about Laplace transforms, transfer functions, electrical systems, translational mechanical systems, rotational mechanical systems. We did DC motor transfer function, which we'll use over and over again in 3720, right? We did a little bit of state space. And then we looked at how the pole locations affect your time response, and we stopped at second order systems, right? So on your exam, again, you'll have basically four questions. Okay, and this is where I'm going to stop the course. I mean, this is another the course. So on your final exam, like I said, question one is given um, step response, plot, find transfer function. Can read an example of this. Second and third are, um, what are the two questions? 70, I forgot. So look at last lecture, you remember? Prop 474 and 475. I have posted the video online. We solved 74, I also solved 75. We almost solved it, right? So it's online. I don't know, did anybody look at it yet? No, look at it, right? So video online with solutions along with PDF. I can try to find the PDF right now. Because I'm supposed to leave by 9.30, so you have 20 minutes to fill out the online survey. Class climate. Do all of you have your laptops? Yeah, so fill it out. And then, um, whoops, what the heck? No, it's not it. Let's see if I can actually... Wrong one. Come on. Your notes and video. So let's just quickly look at the solution. Hopefully. Hmm. No problems. And I do have the corresponding video for it on YouTube, right? On my YouTube channel. So once the stupid thing loads. Ah, okay. So again. Same four problems which we talked about. Then let me write out the fourth one. And then, so fourth one is given um, transfer function, write it in state space. So these are the four problems on the exam. And I'll give you, calculators are okay. No cheat sheets. I'll give you all the relevant data that you need. But then looking at the last problem, so here it is. Oh, boy. Come on, load. So blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, and there it is. Okay, so I solved it completely. But yeah, please take a look at this. And this should hopefully prepare you well for 3720. Okay. Do you have any particular questions?
before we say goodbye. I think your exam, is it on Tuesday or Wednesday? Tuesday, in the morning, right? 8 o'clock, okay. I think my 2060 is on Wednesday. All right. Okay, so that's about it. So I will see you in the final.